Can you state your name and your profession? My name is Bo Diem. In Vietnamese, we say Bo Diem. I was uh, for a time between 1966 and 72 ambassador of South Vietnam to the U.S. And later on, when I got back to Vietnam after 72, I served as an ambassador at large for Vietnam, mostly with the responsibility of going around the world and promoting the cause of Vietnam. Wonderful. Uh, so uh, this is our second interview with you for a uh, documentary uh, film uh, Journey to Freedom of uh, Vietnamese American and uh, we would like to for you to uh, help us to uh, shine on some of the um, historical event especially the mission of um, uh, or the mission or the effort of um, lobbying for the aid to South Vietnam to fight in the last days uh, uh, in the war. Um, uh, can you recall uh, that uh, right after the um, uh, uh, peace the agreement, uh, Paris peace agreement signed, um, uh, where were you and what you were doing at that time? Uh, can you recall? Well, if we can talk that about uh, the beginning of the withdrawal of the U.S. from Vietnam, we should start by the signing of the Paris Agreement in January 73. And all of us, we know that uh, with the signing of this uh, Paris Agreement in January 73, uh, the U.S. withdrew its troops from Vietnam and uh, continue to add to South Vietnam to defend itself against uh, the communists. But uh, after the signing of the Paris Agreement in 73, January 73, President Thieu was uh, invited by President Nixon to visit the U.S. And so that is the reason why we had the meeting between President Nixon and President Thieu at San Clemente in April 1973. I had been asked by President Thieu during the preparation of the Paris Agreement to uh, try to convince the American negotiator that, uh, well, the Vietnamese, North Vietnamese troops should be withdrawn from South Vietnam, but we didn't succeed it, and the Paris Agreement continued uh, to disregard that this problem of the presence of the North Vietnamese troops in South Vietnam. But somehow the Paris Agreement was signed. And uh, in April 73, President Thieu had the opportunity to come to the U.S. and had meeting with President Thieu in San Clemente. During the meeting of San Clemente, of course, President Thieu sought to have the continuation of the U.S. act to Vietnam and uh, both in military terms and in economic terms. In military terms, it had been, of course, the concern of the South Vietnamese about the continuation of the communists from North Vietnam to continue their war against South Vietnam. And uh, as far as this problem is concerned, that, uh, President Thieu did receive uh, some kind of assurances from President Thieu, from President Nixon, that if it happened that the North Vietnamese committed some kind of violation of the Paris Agreement, the U.S. would react to help South Vietnam. That is the, the kind of uh, promise that um, President Nixon gave to President Thieu at San Clemente. In terms of economic aid, uh, President Nixon said that, well, the U.S. would continue to aid South Vietnam, but in the same time, ask President Thieu 
to go to Washington to lobby some of the U.S. senators for the continuation of this economic aid. And that is exactly what President Teo, after San Clemente, came to Washington and uh, talked to a lot of uh, congressmen and senators uh, for the continuation of economic aid to South Vietnam. But uh, you know that um, sometime around uh, April and May 19, 73 uh, in the US there was a, a very very uh, special development and that we call later on the Watergate and uh, with the Watergate it, um, we saw it right away that uh, it was very difficult for uh, President Nixon to keep his uh, promise he was a uh, almost uh, absorbed by defending himself in the Watergate problem. But somehow, if we continue 73, at the end of 1973, we have seen that uh, the U.S. Congress had voted um, a resolution to the effect that the U.S. troops in Southeast Asia should not continue to operate it the way it had been done before. And so we saw that in military terms, as well as economic terms, there was a, a de-escalation of the U.S. act to South Vietnam. And so the problem continued after 73, and uh, in 74, the situation in South Vietnam, we have seen that the, the communists, they continue their aggression without having the U.S. reacted in one way or another. We, you remember that uh, in 74, there was the Battle of Binh Long, a big battle in which uh, the communist uh, North Vietnam committed a lot of their regular divisions against South Vietnam. But there was not a single, single sign of reaction from the U.S. the way it had been promised by President Nixon to President Thieu at that time of the San Clemente meeting. So, um, I believe uh, from uh, published by many other they mentioned about uh, President Thieu would hesitate uh, or, or have many uh, uh, points against the peace, uh, I mean the, the Paris Agreement uh, and uh, was promised by uh, uh, President Nixon at the time said uh, if you signed it and once again he promised that he will have uh, um, uh, U.S. troops intervene if uh, the attack or violation from the North so the promise uh, would uh, um, have been made before the uh, Paris Agreement. Was it true, sir? Can you elaborate that? Well, it was clear in '73 that uh, the political tension in Washington after the signing of the Paris Agreement, the political tension was somewhat down. But uh, the atmosphere in the U.S. Uh, at this period of time was uh, completely on the internal problem of the U.S. and as I have mentioned before on how President Nixon defended himself in the Watergate mess. And so the U.S. didn't think much in terms of how to help South Vietnam during this period of time. I came to prepare for President Thieu visit in San Clemente and uh, sometime at, uh, in March uh, before the San Clemente meeting, the atmosphere was completely relaxed about Vietnam. People in the U.S. thought it in terms of internal problem more than international problem the way it had been before and that is uh, the reason why 
to a large degree, the problem of Vietnam was somewhat out of mind of the U.S. They said that they got out already and so they have to concentrate their attention to all the problem, internet problem as well as the problem in the Middle East for instance, you see. And so we saw right away that there was a continual continuation of the degradation of the U.S. interested in the problem of Vietnam. So uh, I would like to understand once again about the promise that the U.S. Uh, had to President Thieu visit South Vietnam uh, even would uh, uh, delay to uh, President Thieu before uh, the uh, Paris Agreement signed. Um, and my next question would be, although promise could uh, verbally uh, promise that is quite an interesting point because uh, the, these uh, promises uh, were uh, only the kind of uh, verbal promises, you see, not the kind of written promise uh, the way it had been done in South Korea, for instance, or in Japan. There was a, a formal agreement between South Korea and the U.S. and between Japan and the U.S. to the effect that if there are problems with South Korean being attacked by North Korea, well, the U.S. had, had the duty to intervene, you see, but not in the case of Vietnam. And that is a very interesting point that the Vietnamese have to remember in the future. If there is something to be done, it should be done in writing and approved by the U.S. Congress instead of, well, just a kind of verbal promise from the president. President can be one day uh, for a one policy, but suppose that there is another president coming in and, uh, well, uh, the new president cannot um, is not obliged uh, to continue the same policy advocated by the previous president, you see. In case of South Korea or in case of Japan, for instance, there are written agreements and then uh, all the president coming after the agreement signing before, well, they have to follow the same pattern, you see. And that is a very important point for the Vietnamese in the future, that if there is something with a uh, another big power on some problem, it is uh, better to be on writing and approved by the U.S. Congress than the kind of simple verbal promise from a president or from a secretary of state like Henry Kissinger. Henry Kissinger, he quite often said to me that you can count on us, you see, well, how we can count on him with this kind of verbal promise like that. So, um, I believe that President Thieu was uh, asked to visit um, U.S. Uh, before the Paris Agreement signed. Uh, was it true? And yes, I had been in touch with Mr. Huang Đức Nha, but then the private secretary of uh, President Thieu and many times already uh, I had communication with him about this problem that we call it the fishing expedition, or just a kind of court name between himself and myself. Well, uh, through the official fishing expedition, we tried to convince the American government uh, that they should invite the President Thieu to visit Washington. But somehow, for one reason or another, and with one motive or another, the U.S. declined in this kind of suggestion from our part. And uh, President Thieu was uh, lucky to have an opportunity to, to visit um, the U.S. At, uh, at San Clemente when the Paris Agreement was signed already. Yes, people seem to think that a that, uh, present the present from U.S. Uh, give to President Thieu for what he, uh, you know, he did uh, U.S. request by signing the Paris Agreement. What is your opinion on that? 
Well, I think that to a certain degree uh, it was uh, quite uh, clear that uh, just before the Paris Agreement being signed, there were talks between myself and General Hackett and Henry Kissinger, for instance, you see. Uh, it was implied that, that, well, go ahead and sign the Paris Agreement and after that it would be a kind of invitation to President Theo to visit San Clemente. As far as this part of the promise, they keep it and they invited Theo to San Clemente, you see, in April. But uh, uh, from my very personal point of view, I think that, well, uh, a big power like the U.S. behave not a very elegant way with uh, the South Vietnamese because they dwell uh, on the side of the communist world. We heard it that uh, in Moscow sometimes they call the South Vietnamese the bastards. But uh, when South Vietnam, North Vietnamese visited Moscow, it was always a red carpet, you see. So uh, it was a, a, a very, very sensitive problem between the U.S. and Vietnam during the whole war in Vietnam. President Thieu never succeeded in coming to the U.S. itself because uh, the last visit on the U.S. soil before San Clemente was a Honolulu. I came to Honolulu with President Thieu. Well, that, uh, that was the only visit of President Thieu had made it to the, to, to the U.S. at that time. So you would mention that uh, Salvador Basta, who called him and in what occasion, do you remember? Oh, well, it was uh, been reported in many press reports, uh, international press reports, rumors and, and uh, quotations and a lot of things like that. <coughs> Sorry, it had been mentioned many times already that those um, Russians, they were not um, always happy about the North Vietnamese. And uh, I would presume that uh, the same attitude that, um, from the Chinese uh, was not um, far different from the attitude that um, those people in Moscow had in regards to the North Vietnamese. I see. And the uh, <coughs> people are calling North Vietnamese as bastards? Well, as I have said before, I heard a lot among the diplomatic circle that once uh, Russians had a very bad idea of the North Vietnamese, but, well, they receive it, you see, the North Vietnamese. Um, so and now we are back to Saint Clemente of uh, yeah, meeting. Uh, you recall what is the content? Uh, really, the core of that meeting was. Well, the core of the meeting, as I have just mentioned to you before, it was uh, uh, in two parts. In the military part, that uh, it was promised that if there was a violation of the Paris Agreement, the U.S. would intervene violently, yes, he retaliated against North Vietnam. And uh, in terms of economic aid, that, uh, the U.S. promised to continue the, to add that South Vietnam, in spite of the fact that, that by 1973 and by 1974, it was down already, you see, not at the level we had before. And uh, through some kind of uh, manipulations inside the budget of the defense, you see, some of the uh, 
part of the added was a switch from the economic added to the side of the military part of the, of the defense department. And so consequently the added economic added and military add to South Vietnam was uh, substantially reduced even before 1974 and 1975. And when in 75, when I came to lobby for an emergency act in um, in April 75, well, it was the final act from the U.S. to cut more to to cut act to South Vietnam. You know very well that I came to the U.S. in April 75, in March 75. To lobby for uh, what we call an emergency act of 700 million to South Vietnam. So you uh, just talk about the reduction of the aid from U.S. to South Vietnam. Can uh, you recall uh, uh, when uh, and what was the maximum that we got from U.S. and then from there it start reducing to? 700 million and you have to make a trip to r try to uh, I mean secure that but uh, didn't have success so can you recall what I don't the have the, the, the figures uh, about uh, the US added in South to South Vietnam but at that period of time but I remember vividly that uh, Military aid and economy added to South Vietnam in 74 and 73 was uh, re almost reduced to a mere around 300 or 400 million. Very good. Reduced I have from, to, from what number? One figure? The highest? From at least 700 million before, you see. And uh, well, we have to double check about these figures, but I remember that it was sometime between 700 before, million before, and, and it was reduced later on. And please remember that with the uh, war in Israel and the oil crisis at that time, the cost of uh, oil was very much uh, very high and um, most of the added was consumed by this kind of high cost that we had to pay for many many uh, part of the US to South Vietnam. Uh, so uh, in uh, the trip that the um, president made in uh, 1973 uh, did he see anybody in Congress? I mean, uh, House and Senate? Oh, yes. Uh, when we had been in San Clemente, President Nixon uh, uh, had some kind of advisors to President Thiel about uh, how to lobby the uh, U.S. Congress for the continuation of U.S. to South Vietnam. And uh, consequently, after San Clemente, President Thieu came to Washington. And uh, from advisors of President Nixon, he visited a lot of senators uh, on the budget committee, senators, standees, for instance, and some other senators in view of explaining to them the needed of South Vietnam for the continuation of aid to South Vietnam. And in fact, that Mr. Thieu did visit a lot of U.S. senators and congressmen. I went along with him at that time. How was it, the uh, atmosphere when uh, door meetings went? Well, the atmosphere was uh, quite uh, correct at that time because, uh, as I have mentioned before, there was no more political tension that we had uh, during the war. So the conversation was uh, okay, all right, but uh, they advised us to continue to lobby for U.S. Ed in contacting a lot of congressmen and other senators, and that is exactly what we did later on.
without much of success, I have to confess. But uh, we continue a lot after this San Clemente meeting to uh, visit the U.S. congressmen or visit the U.S. senators for U.S. aid to Vietnam. But unfortunately, we didn't succeed much. Uh, that that you you value like a diplomatic, but no, not much action. I mean. Uh, uh, well, I, well, there is no possibility of more action than what we did at that time because that, uh, we have to remember that in South Vietnam after 73 we have a lot of problems in terms of how to face the continuation of attacks from North Vietnam. My question was that those uh, reaction from Senator and Congressman, they very much like diplomatically meet a delegation from Vietnam, but yeah. that's what I meant by Yes, and we invited a lot of uh, U.S. congressmen and senators to visit South Vietnam by that time, but uh, you remember that uh, there are a lot of uh, congressmen from the U.S. Uh, who are very much on the left side of the political section. And the lady, if I remember well, Abdul Aziz, the lady with the hat who came to Vietnam and who... Oh. Hmm. Yes, um, uh, you're talking about the actress, uh, uh, Jane Ponda. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, um, the interest of the U.S. in South Vietnam was not at the level it should be for uh, Vietnam to defend itself. And uh, the continuation of the attacks from, the, from those people who sympathized with North Vietnam continued. And uh, that is the reason why it was uh, difficult for the U.S. congressmen who were on our side uh, to continue to vote it for uh, the same amount of budget that they had um, given before to, to, to South Vietnam. Wonderful. So, for visit by President Thieu until 1975 uh, uh, that you have the mission from President Thieu came to U.S. Uh, uh, to try to, uh, for I call it the impossible mission for aid, fighting aid for Vietnam. Since that year of time, from 73 to 75, what was, what, can you describe what was the, well, the briefly, of, um, briefly speaking, uh, the situation in South Vietnam deteriorated beginning by 74. The economy of South Vietnam by then was in bad, bad shape. The civilian government employees and uh, the families of the soldiers, they were in very, very bad shape in terms of economic situation. Adding to that, the situation in Vietnam in political terms was serious too because there was opposition to President Thieu. That is the reason why when after the attack from the communist side in the area of Binh Long, where the communist side committed a lot of regular divisions, their own regular divisions. We had serious problems both in economic terms and in military terms. This situation continued at the end of 74 and the beginning of 75. And as I have mentioned before, there was not a single reaction 
from the U.S. society in terms of how to react to the communist attack because it, it had been clearly demonstrated to everyone that the communists violated the terms of the Paris Agreement. To a certain degree, uh, this kind of attitude from the U.S. encouraged the North Vietnamese to continue their attacks against South Vietnam, especially when they receive a massive aid from the Soviet Union and the Chinese. So the situation in South Vietnam deteriorated in both economic terms and in military terms up until the beginning of uh, 75. And on March uh, 75, if I remember well the date, uh, the communist uh, side that attacked the South Vietnamese in the city of Ban Mi Thuot. And the South Vietnamese lost the city of Ban Mi Thuot on the 10th of March 1975. Yeah, I would like to ask you a question right there. That many people uh, later on, I, I interviewed, you know, you know uh, South Vietnam Miss officer uh, and um, other politicians, they think that uh, President Thieu intentionally abandoned Ban Mi Thuot to get attention from the U.S. How was your comment on that? Well, that is a very special aspect of the problem. I try myself to ask President Thieu about his decision to withdraw from playing play coup and control in 1975 after the loss of Ban Mi Thuot. To be very candid with you, I never succeeded in having a clear-cut answer to this problem because uh, Mr. Thieu refused to see me for one reason or another after 75 and I had never the opportunity to ask him the very specific questions of about how he made the decision to withdraw from Pleiku and Kantu. But anyway, on after the loss of Van Mietwood in March 1975, Mr. Thieu asked me to come to see him. I remember very well. He asked me to go to the U.S. to lobby for a, an emergency aid of 700 million. I remember well. He talked in terms of a Vietnamese uh, saying as long as uh, there is still water, we have to scoop it. He said to me that, well, you have to go over there and you have to lobby for this kind of very special added of 700 million that we call emergency aid. But before going to Washington, please. Can you continue? Uh, yes, uh, and during the meeting of President Thieu, he said to me that, well, you go to see President General Cao Van Vien, who can describe to you the military situation. So I went to see Cao Van Vien after, yeah, sometime around the 17 or 16 of March 1975. Well, I saw a big map on the wall and General King, Calvin Vien described to me the military situation by then. I took the plane that immediately after General, after seeing General Vien, but as soon as I arrived in Paris, it, well, the whole thing collapsed. You see, it means that the withdrawal from Pleiku and Kontum was a military collapse because the communist troops ambushed the Vietnamese, South Vietnamese troops on Route 7, if I remember well. And uh, it was a, a very, very important defeat for the South Vietnamese because it, well, uh, 
the operation of withdrawal from Pleiku and Kontum was not well planned and, and that was the main reason why we suffered a lot of losses during this period of withdrawing the troops from Pleiku Kontum down to Nha Trang. And by then the situation became extremely, extremely dangerous because at, at that time the North Vietnamese attacked at the northern part of South Vietnam in Da Nang and Da Nang fall in the same time. I remember well that I was in Washington at that time seeing the whole thing collapse on TV and uh, trying to get in touch with the, the American side and to try to understand the situation. I understood then that President Ford had the intention to send General William and Shackley to go to South Vietnam for an on-the-spot survey of the situation. The situation in South Vietnam in military terms continued to deteriorate with the loss of Da Nang and the North Vietnamese troops continued their march down to Nha Trang and Phan Rang. General Nguyen Yang visits South Vietnam along with Shak Leng. And when they returned after a week in South Vietnam, I came to see General Nguyen and Shak Leng. Separately, I saw Nguyen and he said to me that the situation is critical, but not in terms of completely lost. And he said that if we can have a, a supply for the Vietnamese, uh, South Vietnamese troops, and perhaps we can stand it for a period of time. So according to General Wayan, it was not completely hopeless. There are still some hopes. But when I saw Shackley at that time, and Shackley had a very, very bad impression. Shackley did not even uh, S-H-A-C-K-L-E-Y, -S Shakley, he mm. knew that I double check in the book of my book. Yes. He was a CIA director of the Asian oh. sector. But he said that he was a young man, Shakley was a young man. Yeah. I talked to General Wayan and I've just mentioned that, well, according to General Wayan, the situation was extremely difficult but was not that hopeless. I uh, tried to see Shakley, the director of uh, the Asian division uh, of the CIA. And Shakley was uh, very, very pessimistic. In the, he described President Thieu at that time as somewhat disoriented, you see, not saying the situation in a clear way. And so I was very, 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 very disappointed myself after seeing Wei Han and Shakri. And uh, in the same time, just for a few more days, I continue to try to lobby for the emergency aid of 700 million. But somehow it was uh, hopeless, exactly the way many of my friends described. Because that when I come to see congressmen, some of the friends who defend me before, who defended South Vietnam before, they tried to avoid me. So I saw clearly the sign of the U.S. decision to give up helping South Vietnam already. And in just a matter of few days, it was a clear-cut decision from the U.S. Congress. They would know to 
the demand of the South Vietnamese and the U.S. administration. I have to confess that uh, the Ford administration continued to do its best, uh, but uh, without many much uh, success itself, you see. And so the U.S. Congress uh, voted no to the demand from the U.S. administration for the 700 million at the two South Vietnam. And by the time that uh, I took the decision that there is no more things to do in Washington and I took the plane to come back to Vietnam around the middle of April 75. So uh, this is a personal question. Um, here you are in the U.S. and try your best, meet many people if they were willing to meet you and uh, do anything you can to try to have people or uh, swing people mind that can uh, come back and help South Vietnam in a critical time and uh, on TV every night you come home and you see the collapsing of the country people die on uh, I mean uh, route number seven and so forth and so on and you uh, draw in the conclusion that well nothing more to do they really they really they abandoned us now What's your feeling like? At, uh, can you well, say? I uh, returned to Vietnam in the middle of April, just one week before the final collapse. I have noticed uh, that uh, there was a, a kind of... Uh, I had the feeling that uh, the South Vietnamese, uh, even at that time, still uh, had a lot of illusions about the U.S. When I met with uh, Vietnamese military men, they talked about rumors that, well, the B-52 can come back at the, and wipe it out at the convoy from North Vietnamese. They talk in terms of uh, Kissinger trying to talk to Moscow in view of having a political situation to save South Vietnam. As far as myself was concerned, I saw it clearly that, well, that is the end of, uh, of the U.S. intervention in Vietnam. And when I saw the Prime Minister Nguyen Bạc Khan, when they asked me about the U.S., I said that, well, my, 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 my opinion is quite clear. The U.S. has abandoned South Vietnam already. There is no way for the U.S. to come to help South Vietnam. It is up to us right now to try to get out of the situation the best way possible. But in terms of relying on the U.S., there is no more possibility of relying on the U.S. at that time. So it was a kind of big disappointment from my friends, both in the government and in the military, when I told them the, the truth the way I saw it in 1975, in, in April 75, when I returned to, to, to Saigon in the mid of April. And uh, as I have mentioned to many friends already, I had um, almost daily contacted with Ambassador Graham Martin. As soon as I get back to Vietnam, he called me on the phone and said to come to see me right away. When I saw him, he said, he asked me the first question, did you see T.O.? I said, no, not that yet, because Mr. T.O. well, would like me to see the Prime Minister, you see. So I didn't have the opportunity to see President Tio. But the next day, my Graham Marlin called me again. Yes, he said, did you see Tio? I said, not yet. And so he said to me that, well, perhaps I have to take the decision myself and to try to see him right away. He came to see Tio on Monday. The 20th, he came to me. And the 21st, Tio, in a public TV session, resigned from his, uh, well, home prince, uh, from the presidency of South Vietnam. So do you think that uh, 
ambassador Martin um, has something to do with that? Well, I think that uh, I don't know exactly what Martin said to Theo at that time, but uh, I remember that um, in the few days before that, when he talked to me, he said to me that, well, you have to tell Theo the truth. And I said to Theo, what truth do you want me to tell him? My truth is that the U.S. has given up South Vietnam already. You want me to talk to him in that terms? He didn't res respond to me at all, but on Sunday he came to see Theo. And obviously he had some kind of uh, conversation with Theo, which convinced Theo that um, there is no way for him to continue to be president and that he have to give up. And exactly what he did on on April the 21st. I stay for us in Saigon in a few more days and, and uh, I uh, asked uh, Martin the way he promised me before, and if you need my help to, to get you out, I called him that there is no place for me right now in Saigon, so I have to get out. And the next day he asked for a private plane from Bangkok, a small navy plane from Bangkok, and I flew out from Saigon in this plane that provided to me by Martin. What day was it, sir? Well, it was at, uh, Monday the 21st was uh, the day Theo resigned, 22, 23, 24, 26, 27, something like that. I flew out just a few days before, two or three days. When I arrived to uh, to Newark, well, uh, the communists uh, bombarded the, the airport of Tanzania already, and so um, and uh, the plane that, um, from uh, Panam was the last to get out of Saigon on that day. So, do you? Uh, 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 trip or when who arranged for him to leave Vietnam after he resigned? Do you know anything about that? No, I know nothing about it, but the uh, American side that uh, on Monday he resigned and on Thursday he left to Vietnam for, um, for Taiwan. And, and of course I didn't see him uh, from the time that I came back. I didn't see him at all. I did, you didn't share the feeling uh, uh, that I asked earlier about when you know that there nothing left for South Vietnam um, and with all your effort you know you did everything and it didn't come to any result and you oh well at that time during these uh, hectic days in, in Saigon there was a lot of rumors from all sides you see rumors from uh, those are people who wish for the U.S. to come back, the way I mentioned. They said that the B-52 would come back and wipe it out the U.S., the North Vietnamese troop. And there was a rumors about uh, the neutralist uh, government uh, with the machination of uh, the French ambassador, Mary Young, by that time. And uh, there was a rumors about uh, Moscow trying to intervene in Moscow for uh, a kind of uh, division of South Vietnam down the 17 parallel, but not on the 17, but down after perhaps uh, uh, including way, for instance. So a lot of rumors, you see, incredible rumors. And, but as far as I am personally concerned, that I was totally convinced at that time that the U.S. had given up on South Vietnam already and that there is no more room for doing anything at that time and that is place for no one in South Vietnam if they wanted to think in terms of having a free South Vietnam at that time. What's your feeling like at that time when you know that? Well, a very sad feeling. I I was sad at that time. I was sick at the same time. And my wife, I called her on the phone and, and we had a kind of uh, uh, 
tacit understanding between us when I say that I am going to attend the, the wedding of a friend, it means that I am going to leave. So my wife asked me, well, you have to go right away, you see. And so I left Saigon on sometime June 24th or 25th, just a few days before the final collapse. Um, I also heard that there was a um, effort of getting a loan from somewhere to support the troop, uh, you know, who are running out of bullets and gas and everything else. Uh, can you elaborate about that? Well, briefly speaking, I have to mention right away that uh, when I talked to the military man when I returned to Saigon, after Washington in April 75, I learned, well, I did learn before, but it was uh, in a very, very stucky terms when I returned that uh, the South Vietnamese practically have no possibility of fighting the war at all because, it, well, uh, there are a shortage of ammunition, there are a shortage of fuel. The planes could not mm, take off to help the South Vietnamese troops, for instance, you see. And the artillery group, for instance, they have a ration of two or three uh, rations of bullet and, uh, in the morning, and as soon as they finish it, that is the end of it, you see. So in practical terms, uh, while the North Vietnamese uh, were uh, massively helped, by tanks and by a lot of heavy arms and ammunitions, you see, the South Vietnamese lack of almost everything. So, no more aid from the US, but in the same time, in terms of military situation in South Vietnamese, troops, they have no more ability to fight the war and they have to accept it. this is a very bad situation of having to defend it with practically almost with our ammunition. And I point out one thing, very often the international, international press when they criticize the South Vietnamese, they say that the South Vietnamese did not fight at all. It is completely untrue because it, when we talk about defeated and about surrender, we never saw before general from a foreign army to kill themselves because they didn't want to surrender to the North Vietnamese talking about the French defeated in 1940. 50, in 1940, mm -hmm. the French defeated by the German in 19. We never, never listen about the French general committing suicide just for not surrendering to the German. And yet the South Vietnamese general they did commit suicide because they didn't want to surrender. It is incredible, but well, that is the truth. And we have to mention it for general generations in the future to understand that the South Vietnamese did fight, but in a very, very, in extremely difficult condition and they committed suicide just for the honor of South Vietnam. Uh, so talking about uh, international press, uh, during the time your mission of fighting aid for, uh, to rescue South Vietnam, uh, did you get a chance to meet any press and if so? Oh, well, I had a very, uh, very frequent uh, 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 I had very many frequent contacts with the international press during my career. 
I was a press man myself, so I was in a very familiar term with them, with all of them. And I have noticed that um, exactly the way it is right now in the U.S. The press, in general terms, was uh, and still is on the leftist side, you see. Most of the time, they have very liberal ideas about freedom and about corruption in the government here and there and so forth, you see. So in general terms, the international press was in favor, without knowing it, that they, well, they worked for the cause of the other side, you see. In 1968, for instance, when I came to Paris to observe the negotiations in Paris between Henry Kissinger and the other side, you see, there was a protest from the students in Paris. It was like an almost a revolution in, in Paris in 1968. Demonstration from students in Paris, demonstration of students in Germany and in almost everywhere, you see. And the international press was in favor of a kind of revolution, as if, uh, well, the population was against the, the government in power at that time, you see. So it is no surprise to me at all when we talk about uh, those so-called sympathy that uh, the international press had for the communist side. You remember the, in Paris, Jean Lacouture and a lot of French journalists, they wrote a lot of things about Ho Chi Minh and about the other people. And only after the war, after they visited Vietnam, after the war, did they recognize that they were wrong in defending the cause of North Vietnam. Because they didn't know much about North Vietnam at that time and they know North Vietnam only after the end of the war. But well, that is an aspect of the international problems around the world, you see. And we have uh, to confront that, uh, this uh, problem the way it had been and the way it is still in many cases. So I ask you, do you see uh, you talking about uh, press criticize South Vietnam? And many of them said that, uh, well, the war we lost the war because of the corruption from government of South Vietnam. What do you have to say about that? Well, I, <laughs> I used to say to my friends that I laugh about it because the corruption is uh, everywhere. Even in the U.S. they have corruption. It is only a matter of uh, degree. I remember that in South Vietnam at that time, perhaps it well, uh, the most corrupted of the general, the maximum that they get is perhaps, uh, well, not up to one million dollars, for instance. That is the most uh, important case, for instance. But right now, the North Vietnamese, uh, they got hundreds and millions and millions in, in, in dollars, you see. So it is a matter of degree, talking about Afghanistan, talking about Iraq, you see, everywhere uh, there is war, there is some kind of corruption. And uh, the international press uh, talked about corruption as if it was uh, the only cause of the defeated of those people. That is completely wrong. Well, corruption we have. I used to say that South Vietnam at that time, of course, was not a paradise. But at the same time, it was not hell either. So, in the beginning of the establishment of democracy, we have to suffer a period of transition from one uh, authoritarian regime to a freer regime in terms of toward democracy. We have all these problems in a human society, you see. So it is normal, it is unfair for the international press to put all these problems on the shoulders of the South Vietnamese by them. I take an example. 
the international press and the US press it used to say that the Americans spent it billions of dollars in South Vietnam. But how much the billions were spent in South Vietnam? The billions of, of, of US dollars spent by the US army was on bombing and on, well, hot meals that the helicopters had to bring to the to the fighting troops and U.S. fighting troops in Vietnam. That is the, the, the kind of, of of billions of dollars U.S. spent by the U.S. Army. I have to say that I am not in an anti-American at all, not at all. But I have to point out the reality the way it is. And it is up to the Vietnamese to understand that in spite of uh, its immense power as a kind of superpower, the American had a lot of influence around the world. And if we can secure the American aid, we should. But in the same time, we have to understand that there are a lot on the American side and we have to understand the American system and uh, understand in the same time uh, the limits of uh, the U.S. power because uh, there are a lot of limits and uh, we have to understand it. I may go a little uh, uh, further by asking you that uh, I see a lot of people criticize South Vietnam society, government and everything and have very little uh, anyone describe about North Vietnam, how the light like, uh, and I interviewed some people who lived in North Vietnam during that time, like the uh, writer Zung Tu Hung, and she described the life and the rest of the population, they lie in one very strong sentence. She said that we live like animals. So um, that kind of light that uh, South Vietnamese or any Vietnamese don't want to live or anybody in the world don't live, uh, don't want to live in. Uh, so uh, can you explain why is that in the world that people ignore, you know, the conditions? Well, it is a very easy to try to explain it because it, uh, you agree with me that, uh, well, uh, the North Vietnamese uh, for dozens and dozens of years, uh, they live with them in a very, very well, uh, a totally controlled society, and they know nothing about uh, the outside world. You talk about Zhuang Tuong, for instance. Zhuang Tuong was uh, very much in favor of the other side, and, and uh, they part she participated in many of the operations uh, when she uh, had been in, uh, in the north. And when she came to South Vietnam, she almost uh, cried because uh, she saw the kind of uh, very relaxed atmosphere that we had in South Vietnam at that time, you see. So it is quite uh, understandable. In every communist regime, the population is under total control by the regime and uh, they know almost absolutely nothing about the outside world. Talking about the North Korean, for instance, they know nothing about the outside world. And talking about the North Vietnamese in 1975, I have many members of my family coming from North Vietnam. When they came to South Saigon, they brought some bowls of rice and sugar, and they said that, well, they thought that in South Vietnam we lack everything and that we are slaves of the Americans, you see. And they opened their eyes, but it was too late. And so that is the situation right now. Fortunately, there is a, the internet and people now <laughs> begin to understand more than the way it had been done before. And perhaps one of these days, you see the whole population 
would understand it would come up <laughs> and by then it would be the end of the communist regime but it takes time i used to say to my young friends that when i go around the country to talk to the students i said that well they are lucky to have the opportunity to be in the u.s and to learn how much it means to be in a democratic country like the u.s but in the same time talking about vietnam they have to be patient because the, the communists are still over there obviously there was a lot of uh, a lot of uh, change already you see we have seen that uh, from the 80 for instance the end of 80 and to the situation right now there are a lot of change but it still take a little bit of more time the, for the population to understand completely how much it is difficult to live in under the communist regime. And so perhaps later on, well, in the next future, sooner than later, I hope, the people of South Vietnam and the people of North Vietnam would wake up and would see a more freer, more democratic, respecting human rights for the people with dignity. So, um... Uh, <laughs> yes, you yes. have to begin about <laughs> uh, Who Ho, Ho Chi Minh was? So. Well, there are a lot of books in uh, literature about Ho Chi Minh. Most of the liberal press that uh, gives the impression all the thought that Ho Chi Minh was a nationalist. Uh, trying to save Vietnam from French and colonialism. Well, my personal opinion is quite clear. If I can give him some benefits of the doubt, I would say that, well, uh, there are a few percentage in his mind for uh, Vietnam. But most of the times when he worked for the third international communism, even when he was uh, young, his mind was uh, most of the time on the communist side and more than a nationalist side. I remember well, he said that before his death that if I have to join later on in the next war, I would like to join in Max and, and so forth, you see. So, well, his mind is more on the communist side than more on the nationalist side. So, um, I mean, the press in the textbook, film, uh, all sort of media, when they describe Lenin, uh, Stalin, uh, Mao in uh, China, they all call them brutal dictator and they yeah, describe them uh, very clearly that those uh, bad leaders kill their own people, uh, so on and so on. But uh, Ho Chi Minh, uh, they uh, have a very different, uh, I mean, uh, uh, description that he uh, the father of the country who brought uh, independence, happiness to Vietnamese people and uh, of course, we don't see that. How is that that happens? Well, that is uh, what I call it uh, in the 60s, a kind of wave in the international world. A wave in favor of communism. I take the concrete example of uh, the French intellectual that I used to call the intellectual of the left side of the Seine, les intellectuels de la rive gauche. You see Jean-Paul Sartre, we see Jean Lacouture. Jean Lacouture wrote a book about Ho Chi Minh, but later on he visited South Vietnam and later he returned and he wrote another book completely different from the previous book. André Gitte, the famous writer from the French, he was uh, very much in favor of Lenin and Stalin and so forth. But when he visited Moscow and he returned, he wrote a book 
retour de l'URSS. It means that after the visit to the Soviet Union. So it means that they, there was a time when the communist wave was much in, on a high time, you see. And when the communist wave was on a high time and almost the intellectuals around the world, almost the international press was in favor of the communists, it is only now that they begin to understand what does it mean to be communist and to have to live and earn the communism. Uh, so, uh, thank you for have that and clear uh, in the message. Um, this is, I want to ask you also, here uh, a lot of uh, books, uh, material, uh, a film, uh, they call us, South Vietnam, and you present South Vietnam in the United States. They call us, uh, they call you, um, American puppets. What do you feel about that? Well, as a Vietnamese who walked in Washington during this period of time, I would say that uh, the South Vietnamese uh, depend too much on the American side, you see. And that is the reason why they gave to the eye South world the impression that they were the puppet of the American. And the Americans them, themselves, in many cases, they didn't try to correct this kind of uh, image at all. Not because they had bad intention, but uh, they have a very special attitude. I used to say that uh, the Americans uh, were too much impatient. And when they came to South Vietnam, they want to do everything by themselves. It is a kind of uh, impairment on the American side. They said, let us do it, do it quickly. And after that, we give it back to the South Vietnamese. But instead of asking the, 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 the Vietnamese to do things, they did it themselves. And by doing it, they created the impression around the world that the South Vietnamese were a puppet. I was not a puppet at all when I talked to President Johnson or to McNamara or to all the high official on the American side, on the American side, uh, uh, Dean Russ, for instance, or all the people. I want an in independent man. I point out to the American the kind of point of view of a Vietnamese. And just as I have mentioned to you before, when I saw American President President Johnson after the Tet attack of 68, I mentioned to him that, well, while the other side that have the AK-47, the Vietnamese soldiers in, in still use their own guns and uh, and, and, and yeah, and I asked President Johnson to give instruction to the effect that the South Vietnamese would have the M16. And in fact, that the next day when I saw Clark, he repeated to me that well, in fact, that President Johnson did give him an instruction to provide M16 for the South Vietnamese. Just a little example among all the things you see. But in the same time, getting back to your question, it is, well, the South Vietnamese were to a certain degree victim of the international situation at that time. I used to say that if I have to talk it in terms of how were the real cause of the defeat of the South Vietnamese in 75, I said that, number one, there is a stubborn friend who refused to give back to Vietnam the independence that the Vietnamese people deserved. Second, that the kind of obsession from the communists who would like to impose it on the South Vietnamese a kind of Stalinist, Leninist regime on the entire people. That is an obsession from their part. And that is the reason why they continue to 
the, the, the to wage war against South Vietnam. And the third cause that was uh, not cause but a kind of factor in it, the American intervention. They intervened, but they intervened in their own way. And when they, after getting tired of the war, they left their own way too. And so that is one of the um, three main reasons that I said were uh, somewhat instrumental in causing the South Vietnamese. Well, I repeat it again, and I am not an anti-American at all, but I am quite a realist. When I talk to the South Vietnamese, I ask them to understand the realities and understand the American system. Politics in America is different from politics elsewhere. And, uh, and they have their shortcoming. They have their uh, uh, tradition, good traditions of defending freedom and uh, human dignity, of course. But in the same time, they have a limitation too, and they have own way of intervening. And that is the reason why we talk about the situation in Iraq and in Afghanistan, for instance. The same problem that the U.S. encountered in South Vietnam, they met it in, in, in Iraq and in Afghanistan. And so, um, when you say so, you have uh, analyzed and you said the three reasons. I see you talking about France, you're talking about not Vietnamese, uh, you're talking about American, and you think that, uh, what about South Vietnamese government? Of course, you see, I said to my book that the Vietnamese have to accept it, their own responsibility of the war. They had the wrong assumptions about uh, the American. They thought that the American, the way they saw them, after the Martian plan in Europe, they saw them defending the South Korean, and uh, they thought that uh, the American were the eternal defender of freedom and so forth. It is uh, quite natural that uh, the American, as a big power, have a lot of influence around the world, but in the same time, and in spite of uh, the traditional values that the Americans kept up for themselves, defending freedom, defending democracy, and defending human dignity, and so forth, they have their own system, and they have their own limitations, and we have to understand clearly this problem before relying completely on the American the way we did before in 1960s and in 1970s, you see. And it is a hard lesson for the South Vietnamese. They have to think in terms of depending on themselves first, you see. And right now, if the, South, if the, if the Vietnamese people have to defend themselves against the Chinese, they too have to think in terms of uh, relying on themselves. You know very well that uh, people in South, in Vietnam right now used to say that if we go to the Chinese, and perhaps we can save the party, but we lost the country. But we go on the side of the American, and we can save the country, but we lost the party. In fact, that we have to rely on ourselves. In our history, the savior of Vietnam was uh, fighting against the Chinese alone without anyone helping them. And so we have to rely on the people itself in promoting freedom and democracy and only through this uh, kind of um, promotions of um, freedom and democracy and relying on the old people that the Vietnamese can have the resources and the ability and the willingness to defend themselves against outside interference. Uh, yes, sir, uh, you spend a lot of time and also effort to
serve your country as a diplomat and uh, many people were thinking about Vietnam War uh, we lost it not just because of the battle but very much uh, you know from uh, political side um, so uh, how do you feel uh, looking back how do you feel about the loss of country uh, personally well looking back at the into the past, uh, I think that uh, it was a very unfortunate that the people of Vietnam had to meet that unfavorable circumstances in the fight for the independence of the country. First of all, uh, we have to remember that uh, immediately the end of the Second World War and after the defeat of the French by the Germans in 1940, the Vietnamese for the first time after 100 years of domination under the French, the Vietnamese people saw some hope of getting back the independence of the country. But it was unfortunate for the Vietnamese people that the communists uh, had the upper hand in conquering the power in Vietnam in '45, And the Vietnamese people had to suffer from the communist regime from then on until today. And as I have mentioned in many of my books and writings, I think deep in myself that the nationalists in Vietnam were kept in a very, very difficult situation. In the 50s, they had to, French, to fight against the French for the independence of Vietnam. But uh, they had no choice because of the communists were in power by that time. They had no choice because they had to side with the communists for having an opportunity to fight against the French. Or they can make another choice to refuse to get along with the communists and uh, try to have another way of uh, fighting to gain back the independence of Vietnam. They knew very well that if they continue to be with the communists, the nationalists of Vietnam would be one of these days squeezed completely by the communists, by the very, very brutal regime of the communists. And so the choice for them was uh, to side along with the communists to, side, to fight the French or to stay, well, independent from the communists. The nationalists of South Vietnam by then had an opportunity later on in 49 and 50 because there was then the Baudai solution. They thought that perhaps it could be a way out because that Baudai sought at least on paper the independence of Vietnam too. And so the nationalists of Vietnam sided with Baudai in the hope that, well, if South Vietnam can regain independence again, it would be under another regime than the communist regime. But they discovered later on that the French had no real intention at all to help Baudai to gain the independence of South Vietnam. And that was the reason why after the Geneva Conference in 1954 it was only after the Geneva Conference in 1954 that the Vietnamese in South Vietnam 
got in paper the independence, but in the same time, the country divided into two parts, divided by the 17 parallel, up north the 17 parallel were the communists and down the 17 parallel was the Baudai regime. And the situation continued until the defeat of the French in Dien Bien Phu in 1954. And by then we had the Geneva Conference. And uh, the French uh, by then had reluctantly to accept the independence of Vietnam. In 1954, we had up north in 17 parallel, up north in the 17 parallel, the regime of the communists, and down in the 17 parallel, the Baudai regime. But then we began to have uh, the... <coughs> yes, can you continue about uh, you uh, analyzing uh, about what happening and it lead to your feeling and, you know, looking back the war and the loss of mm -hmm. South Vietnam? Well, I just mentioned to you to you the difficult situation in which the nationalists of Vietnam found themselves during the whole period of the war. First of all, they had to make a choice between fighting along with the communists against the French, knowing exactly that one of these days under the communist regime they would be squeezed out brutally by the very, very difficult regime of communism. But later on in South Vietnam, when the American came to help President Diem after the division of the country into two parts, up in 17 parallel were the communists and down the 17 parallel was the regime of uh, chief of state of Baudai. He had been an emperor, but later on he took the title of chief of state instead of king or emperor of Vietnam. And uh, the Americans became too interested into Vietnam only in very substantial way. By the beginning of 1954 in helping the regime of President Diem. President Diem was uh, appointed Prime Minister by uh, Chief of State at Baudai in 19, immediately after the Geneva Agreement. But in the same time, under the regime of President Diem, in spite of the fact that all the nationalists of Vietnam had a lot of respect for President Diem, his regime was somewhat very, very personal. Almost uh, all the political party were excluded from the regime because uh, President Jim concentrated his attention on those people around him and especially on those people from his family especially Brother Modinu. The regime of President Diem lasted for uh, nine years until 1963 when he was overthrown by a coup d'etat organized by the military group of South Vietnam. And uh, the nationalists of Vietnam, when they suffer of being excluded from political activities during President Diem regime, they thought that, that uh, they had some beginning of uh, possibility for them to participate in the political life of South Vietnam. So it was under the regime of the military people 
President Teo, Prime Minister Nguyen Cao Kỳ, and so forth. And uh, the military regime, but uh, <coughs> the military regime was in name because that in spite of the fact that there were two generals at the head of the government, they organized a kind of normal election in 1967. And so General Thieu became president of the Republic of South Vietnam and General Nguyen Cao Kỳ, the former prime minister, became vice president. And it lasted until 75. But when I talk about the nationalists of South Vietnam, or in general terms about the nationalists of Vietnam. I mentioned the fact that, that they had always in a very difficult situation. It was before between siding of the communists and fighting the French. Later on, siding with the Baudai solution in spite of the fact that, that it was a very imperfect solution due to the obstination of the French not to give back total independence of South Vietnam. And later on, under the regime of President Thieu, it was uh, not really what we call a dictator regime, but a, a very, very strong authoritarian regime, which excluded the participation of many of the nationalists of Vietnam. And until later on, they had to collaborate with the military people to survive during the whole period of the existence of South Vietnam until 74 and 75. It was a rather sad history for the nationalists of South Vietnam. They have to accept their responsibility in everything, in their conduct against the communists, in their conduct against the French, in their conduct against the Baudai solution, again they conducted their conduct against the president Xiem regime. But somehow during the almost 30 years of the war, beginning by 1945 until the end of South Vietnam in 1975. The nationalists of Vietnam never had a real chance to fight for the independence of Vietnam and in the same time to begin the democratization of Vietnam. And while there is a beginning of democracy, I repeated a beginning of democracy under President Xiem regime and under the military regime later on. It was a, a kind of a constant fight. They had to accept it under always imperfect circumstances. Real choice for true democracy and human dignity, they didn't ever have the chance to do it until the day they were completely submerged by the communist offensive, military offensive of the communists in 1975. It is a sad story, as I have mentioned to you before, and all the Vietnamese have felt it. They thought that for a time that they could count it on the American, but they had wrong assumptions about the the the, 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 the stability of the US foreign policy. And so uh, until the day they discovered that uh, they did not um, 
they could not rely anymore on the on the American hated. So by the time they discovered it, it was in, already under the communist regime. So it is a very, very sad history. And I think that all the com nationalists of Vietnam, they felt the same way I did. <clears throat> so um, uh, I know that you uh, was uh, the head of uh, one national, uh, national uh, political party um, that did. Can you tell me about when it was found and then, uh, you know, some Oh, main... uh, it is a history of all the political parties of Vietnam by then, like the Vietnam Kukendang, like all the parties in Vietnam. They began their uh, fight against the French and even before the coming of the communists. But by the time the communists came to power in '45, well, uh, they lost uh, this opportunity because the communists had controlled everything. And so, well, it is a, a kind of fight and without possibility of uh, of winning everything in terms of democracy and freedom for the people of South Vietnam. The Dai Viet Party, like all the party, were also founded in the beginning of the 40, even before the coming of the communists by then, you see. So, myself as a young man, I knew nothing about it. I knew only, like all the young Vietnamese by then, that we had to fight for the independence of the country. But uh, the joining, my joining of the Dai Viet Party was just a, a kind of uh, circumstances through which friends or members of the families, uh, they asked me to join the party because it, the totality of the young men by then knew nothing about the Viet Minh, the communists. They knew nothing about the Dai Viet. They knew nothing about the Vietnam Golden Dang. Well, perhaps a little bit about the Vietnam Golden Dang, but most of the time they knew nothing about the Nationalist Party. They joined the Nationalist Party just by, well, by special circumstances. Whether they are, uh, whether they have friends in, in, who join at already the easy party, or they have their members of the family joining the, the this party already. So my case was not different from all the case of the young Vietnamese by then, and so the totality of the Vietnamese people in the 40 after the defeat of the French in 1940 by the German. They saw an opportunity for them, opening the horizon. So the circumstances were for fighting for the independence and all the Vietnamese people, whether they are nationalists or not nationalists, they knew but one thing, fighting for the independence of the country and that is the reason why some of them joining the Dai Viet, some of them joining the Vietnam, some of them the Viet Minh. It depends on the circumstances. And so later on it became a kind of country divided into two parts, on the side of the communist and on the side of the non-communist. So that is a very, very sad situation of the, of the Vietnamese people who through the international circumstances by then and through the happening of the circumstances in Vietnam itself after the surrender of the French and after the surrender of the Japanese and after the intervention of the Chinese troops, they found themselves under the communist regime in North Vietnam. It was a very sad story and myself included in it. So what is your last wish for Vietnam? Well, 
I left in Vietnam in a plane of the American he provided to me for flying from Saigon to Bangkok. It was hopeless by then. And when I was on the plane and then I look out of the window, the Delta of Vietnam, fly bound, fly out and, uh, under the windows of, 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 of my little plane. And I cried by then. Just one hour after, with my eyes blurred, my <laughs> the tears, the plane landed in Bangkok, and so that is a, a very sad story of a man who had to leave South Vietnam under very very difficult circumstances like that, leaving behind my friends, leaving behind my home, leaving all the things that I cherish in South Vietnam by there. And from the day on, I never returned to Vietnam. Very sad story. Thank you very much, sir.